Hey, P Statistics, welcome to section 10.3, uh, comparing two means for uh, paired data. In this section, we're going to learn our last two kind of standard um, inference procedures. So uh, analyze, by the end of the section, you should be able to analyze the distribution of differences in paired data set. Uh, in a paired data set using graphs and summary statistics, construct and interpret a confidence interval for a mean difference, perform a significance test about a mean difference, and determine when it's appropriate to use paired T procedures versus two sample T procedures. All right, so uh, paired data. A researcher, let's start out with an example. A researcher studied a random sample of identical twins who had been separated and adopted at birth. In each case, one twin, we call twin A, was adopted by a high-income family, and the other twin, twin B, by a low-income family. Both twins were given uh, IQ tests as adults. So here is our data. We see we've got the pair. Uh, we've got pair one. These these two were twins. Uh, one, the twins IQ in the high-income family, 128. The twins IQ in the low-income family, and so on. We go down the line. This is the second pair of twins, so on. We have 12 pairs of twins. And so if we plot, we can look at these separately. We can look at twin A, the high-income family twins, and we can see their IQ scores. And we see the low-income IQ scores uh, for the twins that were placed in OLO uh, and those families. So... Uh, Looking at this, twins raised in high income households had a mean, a higher mean uh, IQ, so X bar sub A, we find their mean is at 109, uh, whereas X bar sub the B, so the mean of those is 103. Um, so there is a similar amount of variability in IQs for these two groups of twins. And so we can see that the, the range looks about the same. If you calculate the standard deviation, you can see it's not very big difference. A little bit more variability in A, but about the same between the two groups. Um, so we can compare uh, those couple of things. Um, but with so much overlap between the groups, the difference in means does not seem statistically significant. And so we could theoretically try and perform a two sample t-test to see if there's a significance difference between those but there's quite a bit of overlap um, and so yeah not uh, if we did that we wouldn't end up getting significant results all right so in uh, the previous analysis ignores the fact that these are paired data so paired data result from recording two values of the same quantitative variable for each individual uh, or for each pair of similar individuals um, so uh, in this case, the pairs are the twins, but we can do, we, we've done matched pairs design before where we pair individuals who are similar in some other way, or the same person does it two different ways. Um, and so if we go through, we have all those pairs. We could also look at the differences between those. And so these two twins, notice it's these twins kind of, the twins um, IQ scores tend to vary together. So these twins, both, both values are pretty high but the high income twin had a higher IQ score or higher IQ uh, test score. Um, you know, whereas over here, you know, these twins were both pretty similar as well, but not, not as high as this group. And, and similarly kind of throughout, they kind of go up and down a little bit together. So when we do this, if we look at just these specific differences, pair one, uh, their difference was eight. The uh, high in, uh, twin with the high income family uh, had uh, their IQ score was eight points higher. And if we look across the board, we kind of start to see a little pattern of a Merv cheer where only in one case was the twin from the higher income family have a, have a lower IQ score. Um, and so if we actually look at the differences, the mean difference is uh, of all the differences. So these are this is the mean of one list of differences is 5.833 as uh, the, the mean of those differences. And then the standard deviation of those distance differences is uh, 3.93. And so that's just like this graph of data. Um, and so we can analyze these you know, indi individually in those two groups, or we can look at just a list of differences for those twins. Look at the, yeah, compare them directly to each other rather than just one big group to another big group. Remember we did this in our experimental design where we'd say if we randomized into treatments, we'd compare group to group. But if you look at um, matched pairs, you can actually look at all the individual differences. You look at those individual differences and then kind of an analyze those differences. And that's actually the math we're going into in this chapter. Uh, so remember the profit method of analysis depends on how the data are produced. So uh, analyzing paired data to analyze paired data, start by computing the difference for each pair, then make a graph of the differences, use the mean difference, and they call it X bar sub diff, uh, and the standard deviation of the differences, S sub diff, as summary statistics. 
Um, and so that's how we'll, we'll, we'll approach it when data is paired. In fact, it's inappropriate to do this two sample T procedures because uh, we one of our requirements is really that they're independent random samples. Um, and uh, you know, if we're going to treat it that way, and um, these wouldn't be independent. They're related, right? They're twins in that case. So uh, they aren't independent random samples. They're paired, and so we should do a, a paired analysis. And so we look at it, a list of differences. So uh, paired data here, uh, does music help or hinder performance in math? Student researchers uh, Abigail and Carolyn and Leah designed an experiment using 30 student volunteers to find out. Each subject completed a 50 question single digit arithmetic test with and without music playing. Uh, for each subject, the order of the music and no music treatment was randomly assigned. So remember, when people are pairing with themselves, we randomize at least the order that they get the treatments in. And so we are randomizing treatments. And the time complete, uh, to complete the test in seconds was, uh, in seconds was recorded uh, for each treatment. Here are the data along with the, differences, uh, the difference in time for each subject. And so we had student one, their time with music took 83 seconds, without was 70. And so the difference music minus without is 13 seconds. It took them 13 seconds longer with music, 13 longer with music, and so on. And so we can see all of those set of differences. And so this is asking us to make a dot plot of the differences, you know, music without, minus without, in time for each subject to complete the test. And so the dot plot would look something like this. We got that list of differences. We took their paired data and just turned it basically into one set of differences. Um, and so we can see it's you know, centered around zero and some, some variability on both sides. Uh, so describe what the graph reveals about whether music helps or hinders the performance, math performance. Um, so there is some evidence that music hinders performance on the math test. So 17 of the 30 subjects took longer uh, to compute the test when listening to music. So there's 17 dots on this side, but it is very weak evidence. So uh, there is some evidence. Uh, if we calculate that mean difference, uh, we get the mean uh, difference of 2.8 seconds. If we, if we calculate all those. Um, but the standard EV, or sorry, all of these, so the mean of all those apparently is at 2.8 right around there, I guess. Yeah, I guess there's more, a little more data on the right side here. But, um, you know, that's not going to probably be uh, a significant difference. So uh, that standard deviation is quite a bit, you know, bigger there, 7.49. So the time it took these 30 students to complete the arithmetic quiz with music was 2.8 seconds longer on average than the time it took without music. And we'll eventually do the full inference procedure for this. So uh, there are two ways that a statistical study involving a single quantitative variable can yield paired data. So you can record two values of the variable for each individual. Um, so for example, the experiment investigating whether music helps or hinders learning, or you can have uh, form pairs or si of similar individuals and record the value of the variable once for each individual. So two different individuals or individual compared to themselves. So in that case, the IQ scores of the twins. Uh, it is also possible to carry out a matched pairs experiment using method two if the researcher forms pairs of similar subjects and randomly assigns the treatment to exactly one member of every pair. So we can do an experimental design where we randomize the treatments to you know, like if twins, for instance, or some other individuals that are similar for some reason. So um, confidence intervals for mu diff. Uh, so uh, we're going to actually figure out what that actual difference is. We so far we've just been looking at sample data, but what there is an actual difference for the entire population. And so that's basically what we're going to do. Confidence intervals for that and significance tests for that. So uh, the conditions for constructing that confidence interval, we need our paired data to come from a random sample from the population of interest or from a randomized experiment. So uh, we we basically take those pairs and we, we just need all of those pairs to be you know, like uh, that needs to be a random sample of pairs of individuals. And so that could be twins or individuals that are similar, or they were randomly assigned to those treatments was a, a frequent way we'll do this. Uh, and then if we're sampling without replacement, we need the number of differences. These are like our samples or our sample individuals here are like sample differences, uh, individual differences it needs to be less than 10% of all the potential population differences. 
Uh, and then the normal large counts condition, very similar, just where, again, we're talking about it in terms of differences. Um, but this is, yeah, we're, we're treating us almost just like one sample. The population distribution of differences or the true distribution of differences in response to the treatments is normal or the number of differences in the sample is large, at least 30, or if it's small, we can graph it and make sure it doesn't show any strong skew or outliers. So to calculate a confidence interval, it's actually just like our one sample t interval. We just do it with differences instead. So when conclusions are met, a C percent confidence interval for mu diff is your sample mean differences plus or minus T star times your sample standard deviation over your number of differences. Where T star is that critical value with N minus one, where it's the number of differences. Um, so if we go back to that twin data uh, and perform their significance test. We're going to just focus in on, instead of doing like a two sample t um, uh, interval, we're going to do a one sample t interval on the differences, right? And it would be inappropriate to do a two sample t interval since these individuals are related. So we do a difference and then we just do treat that like one data set for, for differences. So we're going to do a 95% confidence interval for the true mean difference in IQ when raised in high income versus low income. So um, so a 95% confidence interval mu diff, where mu diff is the true mean difference, high income minus low income, in, in, core, in IQ scores for pairs of identical twins raised in separate households. Our plan step, so this is, we end up, it's basically a one sample T interval for mu diff. So it's the, the differences. Uh, and then the random condition, we've got 12 pairs of identical twins. So that's like we treat this as one sample, right? This is of 12 individual pairs. I don't know, it's kind of a weird way of thinking of it. So 12 pairs of identical twins, one raised in a high income household and the other raised in a low income household. Uh, we'll assume that 12 is less than 10% of all pairs of identical twins raised in separate households. And then our uh, normal large counts, we don't have the normal distribution necessarily of differences. We're, rarely will we know that the differences are normally distributed. So we'll hope for the large sample. We don't have that, so we actually graph our data, and it looks pretty good. It seems to suggest that the population might be close to normal. So the dot plot doesn't show any strong skewness or outliers. So then we do carry this through, and then we get back to basically this uh, one sample t interval formula. We have our x bar of differences that they calculated, our standard deviation of differences, our n is 12, uh, degrees of freedom is 12 minus 1, so 11, and then so we can get the t star, you can do the inverse t of um, 0 0.025 with 11 degrees of freedom, or you can look it up in the table, um, and so that's our value we can plug in. Of course, we can also just do, you. this formula is the one sample t interval formula, so t interval in the calculator, um, and so it's x bar diff plus or minus the, the t star and the standard deviation over square root of sample size, and you get that confidence interval. So then conclude, we want to interpret that from 3 to 8. What does that mean? So we're 95% confident that the interval from 3.336 to 8.330 captures the true mean difference, high income minus low income, in IQ scores among pairs of identical twins raised in separate households. So another way of saying that is that the high income twin on average has a, a IQ score that's from 3 to 8 points higher, something like that. And that is the confidence interval for mu diff. Um, in the next video, we'll come back and look at the significance test.